Colleagues, can I take this uh, opportunity uh, to welcome you to the first of the uh, 2012 uh, Gifford Lectures? It seems to me it's 224 years or so since the first Gifford Lecturer uh, stood up to speak. In those days, um, the universities of Aberdeen, Edinburgh, Glasgow, and St. Andrews, where the lectures take place, would have numbered uh, their students in hundreds rather than the many thousands uh, that we now have. However, I suspect that very few of the very many lecturers in those 224 years have had quite the eminence uh, and quite the CV uh, of this evening's lecture. Uh, Professor Coakley, who I'm delighted to introduce, I could now, colleagues, spend 52 minutes, that's a micro-century, uh, describing her CV, um, and you would wonder why um, you had not had the opportunity to listen to her. So instead, I will briefly say um, that following um, her first education at Cambridge and then at Harvard, uh, she was a lecturer, senior lecturer uh, at, La at Lancaster University before going to Oxford, then to Harvard, uh, and she's been a visiting professor of religion at Princeton. Um, while she was at Harvard, I have to say that um, I'm often told and was told when I worked uh, in the research councils that uh, colleagues in the field of divinity uh, were lone scholars who didn't need big grants. Professor Coakley was a recipient of a two million US dollar grant from the Templeton Foundation. And I think uh, that demonstrates, if you like, the, the breadth uh, of her scholarship, and indeed, were I to run through you um, uh, her books and, and uh, her, her uh, articles, then they're just hugely impressive with a sustained period of scholarship over uh, the last 24 years. So, colleagues, I'm absolutely delighted that uh, she is going to give us a series uh, of lectures here in Aberdeen uh, this year. Uh, I might also say that in these days um, of if you like, engagement and indeed uh, of, of impact. Sarah Coakley is also an ordained Anglican priest, a priest of the Diocese of Ely, and has served parishes as an associate in both the UK uh, and the USA. And, she, and she's an honorary canon uh, of Ely Cathedral. So um, in every way, I think we here in Aberdeen are delighted, Sarah, to welcome you and to invite you to give uh, your series of lectures. Sarah will now uh, give her first lecture uh, and then there'll be time uh, for questions afterwards. But could I invite you all uh, to, to welcome her to Aberdeen this evening. <laughs> Professor Diamond, um, Professor Ross, Dr. Wiegler, and other revered members of the Gifford Committee at Aberdeen who have honored me with this invitation dear colleagues and students across the range of arts and sciences in this ancient university, fellow clerics of all denominations, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all for the invitation to speak to you this year as a Gifford lecturer at Aberdeen, and yet I stand before you, as St. Paul once put it, in a certain posture of fear and trembling. For the Gifford mantle is indeed one of great honor, but it also brings its burdens not the least of which is the very responsibility of assuming the role that Adam Lord Gifford intended. And I take that role seriously indeed. As is well known, the task Gifford laid before his lecturers was that of promoting, advancing, teaching and diffusing the study of natural theology. And he defined such natural theology in a way wholly consistent with his own age's presumptions about how science, philosophy, ethics, and theology might converge on a shared, one might say flat, universal plane of rational exploration of truth. It is often said that Gifford intended natural theology to be altogether abstracted from the complications of Christian revelation and grace, and that he aimed thereby for a false secular foundation for such unnecessary doctrinal editor. But that is perhaps not quite true. Here are Gifford's own words. Natural theology, he says, should first include the topic of the knowledge of God, the infinite, the all, the first and only cause. But it must thereby also extend to the knowledge of his nature and attributes, 
and to the knowledge of the relations which men and the whole universe bear to him. And further, it should encompass the nature and foundation of ethics or morals, and of all the obligations and duties thence arising. Gifford's own personal views about God were, to be sure, somewhat heterodox and vacillating, subject to varied influences from the continent of Europe and from North America. He was an admirer of the transcendentalist Ralph Waldo Emerson, for instance. But there was no doubt that Gifford was profoundly interested in the nature of any such God he might believe in, and, a fortiori, on any claims that such a God might make on us as humans in order to transform us. The true knowledge of God, he wrote elsewhere, when felt and acted on, is the means of man's highest well-being. We shall have reason to return to that felt and acted on towards the end of this lecture series. So why is Adam Gifford's project in such dire trouble these days from every direction, that of the sciences, of philosophy, and perhaps most of all, that of theology itself, such that recent Gifford lecturers have mostly either excoriated it or completely ignored it. The resistance to Gifford's vision from the secular sciences first is the easiest to explain. For why should we nowadays expect the knowledge of God to feature at all in any contemporary science's purview of its undertaking? Given that there is, quote, no need of that hypothesis, the issue is seemingly otios, a problem to which we shall have to return in due course. Then secondly, philosophy. Probably I do not need to rehearse here the learned dissection of Gifford's outdated philosophical pretensions, those of the so-called encyclopedist school, by so eminent a commentator as Alistair Mackingar in his own Gifford lectures, Three Rival Versions of Moral Inquiry. Gifford's desire to attain a philosophical completeness outstepping historical tradition and hermeneutical context, now seems to many, including me, both fanciful and inflated. And then finally, theology. Here in Aberdeen, where Bart himself was an unforgettable Gifford lecturer just before the war, I need hardly remind you of Bart's assault on natural theology's offensive capacity to collude with a perverse and far from morally enlightened politics, such as was Germany's in the 1930s. That Bartian tirade against natural theology has been memorably reenacted and extended recently by Stanley Hauerwas in his own critical account of the gift of heritage with the grain of the universe. But for Hauerwas, the lines between the church and scientific reason are, if anything, can this be possible, drawn even more sharply than Bart's, since Bart at least constantly reminds us that the church itself is under judgment. Revelation for Hauerwas will never be encountered in any form in contestation with the secular discourses of the scientists. And even Thomas Aquinas is now read by Hauerwas and a distinguished array of Catholic theologians whom he cites as having no real truck with such extra ecclesial forms of authority. It would doubtless be foolhardy as well as tedious then to do head-on battle with these recent assaults on Giffordian natural theology. As I have already intimated, I agree wholeheartedly with McIntyre that there is no flat plane, as I call it, where our disciplines may meet in any uncontentious quest for truth, devoid of the complexities that come from theory and meaning-making, what we now call hermeneutics, or falsely excised from historical context and inflection. And I also agree, at least to this extent, with Bart and Hauerwas, that any appeal to transcendent divine revelation cannot simply be stumbled upon on such a mythical flat plane either, as if God were one optional item amongst others for our dispassionate scientific consideration. Instead of defending Gifford on these particular scores, then, I shall turn the tables and put my own cards out on them all at once and boldly. For we have, I think, a paradox today as far as Gifford's original vision was concerned, and this paradox will inform my lectures to you throughout this series. The paradox is this. On the one hand, Gifford's particular vision of natural theology, 
is about as outdated in terms of current intellectual fashions as anyone might hope to imagine. Even the few brave voices that are now raised in a minor cheer for natural theology's continuation in a new key seem concessive or embarrassed in tone, arguing for the most part for some sort of perspectival theology of nature, an optional preference for the already converted, rather than a natural theology in the bold tradition of Gifford himself, set on the demonstration of God's truth. On the other hand, the purpose Gifford had for his project as a whole seems to me more urgent and significant, culturally, politically, and morally, than ever before. And perhaps, ironically, this is the more so in a semi-secularized culture in which stories of evolution often now do stand in for older stories of religious meaning. No less a person than David Willits, Minister of State for Universities and Science, has made precisely this point in a recent review in the Financial Times of Martin Novak's most recent book. So how is it that we should decide what is, to quote Gifford again, the means of man's highest well-being in a world torn by conflicting moral systems, pulsing religious beliefs of equally fervent atheism, and seemingly ever-escalating violence, if not in conversation between science, philosophy, and theology? And how could that core moral and theological discussion about the world's flourishing be brought into relation to the most sophisticated scientific advances without such a bold interdisciplinary adventure? Yet even to pose these big question questions in a university setting now sounds somewhat embarrassingly Victorian. Nonetheless, this insistence will indeed be the central contention of these lectures. Adam Gifford is in trouble, all right, in the terms in which he posed his questions and the particular ways he himself tried to answer them. But the questions he asked were the right ones, the big ones, and they don't go away. The fact that Western philosophy in late and post-modernity has been so squeamish or defensive about answering them boldly and universalistically, and theology, for the most part, inclined to favor intra-ecclesial revelatory claims over intricate, critical, difficult negotiations with secular science, is a major part of the problem we now have to face. The public stage has been left to a worrying degree to those who see science as coterminous with atheism. Exposing some of the reasons for this state of affairs will exercise us in the latter part of tonight's lecture. An accompanying problem is that now generations of theologians have been trained without any serious competence in science whatsoever. I myself was one of those victims. I'm embarrassed to tell you I gave up science at the age of 14 to do nothing but read Latin and Greek. But I have repented me. And here is how I now propose to respond to the challenge I lay before you. These lectures are propelled by an intuition that something is now happening in contemporary evolutionary theory, indeed is imploding distractingly within it, which is set to recharge our understanding of the meaning and significance of evolutionary processes in profound ways. Ways which may in turn affect both our moral sensibilities and choices and our metaphysical understandings of the way the world is and what it might be for. Yes, I dare to use that outlawed teleological language, as I shall explain later in this series. Indeed, it may also be through a profound critical engagement with these new understandings of evolution that we shall be rendered more capable of responding to the global challenges that currently affect us in terms of ecology, economics, health, and resistance to violence. These new developments in evolutionary theory, both mathematical and empirical, sometimes in tension with one another, are extensions and refinements of Darwin's original vision of genius, not abrogations of his work. Yet there is a danger, especially in the North American scene, as Connor Cunningham has most recently and penetratingly exposed, that the sheer noise caused by the fruitless standoff between the new atheists on the one hand and the intelligent design supporters on the other both of them fundamentalists in one sense of that overused term, will distract us from the real challenges, both philosophical and theological, that evolutionary theory now holds out to us. 
At the center of these challenges is a newly precise mathematical understanding of what biologists in a technical sense call cooperation. <coughs> Here they trace the countervailing and productive significance of what I call sacrificial behaviors in the span of evolution. Sacrificial behaviors that are no mere background of detritus to the agonistic competitiveness of evolution that is centrally at work in selection, but just as necessary to the very workings and continuation of evolutionary life. Indeed, without these evolutionary populations, we now understand, go into decline. So it is this engagement with the evolutionary phenomenon of cooperation and the precise probing of the structures of evolution with the tools of mathematics, which has recently awakened me from a long dogmatic slumber over the importance of science and of for theology. And it is going to take me the rest of this series to explain to you exactly why. Yet my engagement, I do stress most emphatically at the outset, is not to be confused with two sorts of false moves that I might be accused of at the outset. First, this perspective is not what one might call naively correlationist. It is not because I spy here something that vaguely reminds me of the Christian story so that I cling to it uncritically as a desperate means of new legitimation for the world of theology in an age of secularism. That would indeed be the kind of sellout to scientific fashion that a Bart or a Halwas would quite rightly abhor, and it would almost certainly lead to an unthinking acceptance of some reductive metaphysical moves in secular science that could entirely undo my own theological project. No, it is because I see that evolutionary theory itself is in a state of creative implosion of re-examination of its own theoretical and metaphysical underpinnings that I seek to listen to it afresh in search of truth, but no less also with a profoundly critical probing of its own fundamental narratives of meaning so as to open up afresh the question of God. And thus I begin to see how we can remake Gifford's natural theology in a sophisticated new way that succumbs to none of the notable pitfalls I have so far enumerated. Indeed, not only do I now glimpse how we can do this, but I find, like a kind of upside-down Bart, that the urgency of the times suggests that I am morally and spiritually compelled to such an apologetic task. Anything else would be to flee the scene, to adopt delusory, sectarian religious blinkers, ironically in the name of Bart to distract us from a crisis, both moral and political. Yet secondly, I do not either as a theologian simply abandon my theological commitments at the door in such an engagement with secular science and philosophy. Instead, I strategically dispossess myself to the spirits blowing where it will into all truth, just as in prayer each day I try to practice that same dispossession to the Spirit's calling of me more deeply into the life of Christ, bracing myself for the bumps and lurches and surprises I have been led precisely by Scripture to expect. Only think of Romans 8, 26 following, and the vision there of the pain and pressure of such a dispossessed prayer in the Spirit, groaning into the cosmic vision of Christ's full manifestation. To practice such pneumatological disposition, then, is, I shall insist, no uncritical capitulation to worldly or secular forms of metaphysics that may come insidiously wrapped with the evolutionary theory on offer. Nor, contrarywise, is it a merely optional pietistic veneer, a chosen interpretive lens imposed on the demanding task of doing business with science in all its complexity. On the contrary, this pneumatological dispossession is precisely a guard against both such false alternatives, because it is a dispossession to truth, come what may. And since the secular evolutionary theory in question is itself locked in intra-theoretic conflict, as we shall soon see, as the last generation's set of genetic reductionisms begin to implode, 
we are immediately driven to peel down to the various hermeneutical stories that sustain its different branches and to the metaphysical and meta-ethical choices that those options enshrine. No flat plane, indeed, is to be found here, more like a series of confusing burrows to dig and thrash in. But there, at least in the burrows, we can begin to argue together, both philosophically and theologically. In debates such as these, one has to dig down the philosophical tell to the absolute presuppositions of which R.G. Collingwood once spoke, those which lie hidden in any deep argument of significance, and there engage the big hermeneutical disagreements which science itself is engaged in. One has to have both the spiritual courage and the spiritual humility, but not the false humility of a liberal theology effecting a sellout to secular mores to take on this contestation and challenge. Now, I hope you are sufficiently intrigued or even puzzled or irritated by this new alternative for natural theology to follow me in this task. But for the meantime, let us leave Adam Gifford at least partially vindicated and turn in the rest of tonight's opening lecture to an analysis of why I think it is taking evolutionary theory to recall theology to some of its deepest responsibilities in our generation. The problem, as I shall now suggest, is that a series of seemingly unconnected cultural developments in the latter part of the 20th century have inoculated theology against the profound moral and spiritual power of sacrificial transformation, a theme as deeply woven into the Christian heritage as any. Yet these same cultural developments have also caused sophisticated forms of theology and philosophy of religion to prefer sectarian withdrawal from the scientific fray, such that now, ironically, it is seemingly science that is recalling theology to its deepest and most problematic theme. To illustrate this thesis, I shall first have to make a brief tour through what I call the modern stories of sacrifice and stories of evolution. Only then can we assess what 20th century religious rationality has done to respond to these stories and where the despised natural theology might still make a novel showing. As is well known, the topic of sacrifice is one of the densest and most paradoxicality laden in the realm of religious ideas and practices. A host of complex ideas shelter under its copious umbrella. Offering of a gift or victim, destruction, division, substitution, commensality or eating together, apotropaism, I do like these anthropological words, warding off divine wrath, and of course, moral self-giving. Not all of these evocations are necessarily present in any one cultural or religious context of sacrifice. Many sacrifices are, for instance, bloodless. But usually, several of the meanings are held together in some kind of paradoxical tension. And the ritual enactment of sacrifice, as distinct from the mere cluster of ideas it evokes, may, as Victor Turner once argued, move the ritual actor along a narrative from one pole of meaning to another, from raw evocations of blood and violence, for instance, to cleansed and re-energized expressions of moral altruism. The problem lies in discerning both the difference and the relation of these, in untangling the demonically perverse from the divinely transformative in sacrifice. Now, almost from the opening of the Hebrew Bible, we are in the thick of this dense nexus of sacrificial associations. Cain slays Abel, and the mysterious moral problems about the relation of destruction and offering immediately start to unravel, ones that will create later prophetic disagreements about blood sacrifice even within the Tanakh and further tensions in the New Testament. There we find these difficulties exemplified above all in the epistle to the Hebrews, does Jesus' death bring blood sacrifices to an end or also and simultaneously most perfectly exemplify it, thus immediately re-enlivening typologically all the various sacrifices of the old order? This was, of course, an issue already des also destined 
to split Western Christianity at the Reformation, and thus, ironically, to instantiate the further spilling of blood. For Luther, in the Babylonian captivity, you will recall, the sacrifice of the mass was the third captivity after the reservation of the cup to the clergy alone and the theory of transubstantiation, but by far the most wicked abuse of all, as he put it. This was because it was for Luther an intrinsically manipulative act which offended against his Pauline theology of grace and gift. But what is more rarely commented upon is that Luther excoriated it no less for being illogical. The same thing, he writes, cannot be received and offered at the same time, nor can it be both given and accepted by the same person. This already strikes an interesting proto-enlightenment note. Yet the Council of Trent, in riposte to Luther, was not in the least bothered by the way that giving and receiving operated simultaneously and paradoxically in the Mass. Indeed, we might say it saw this very aspect as intrinsic to its workings. The Mass is a, quote, true and proper verum et propitium sacrifice, Trent states, offered once to God the Father on the altar of the cross. Here the epistle to the Hebrews is cited, just as the reformers had cited it in defense of their position. But still, quote, performed in the mass and offered in bloodless manner, such that the very same Christ is contained and offered, and we receive mercy and find grace. Now there is a pointed philosophical reason for my potted recapitulation of the Western history of sacrifice in this context, and it is this, the apparent clash of rationality and sacrifice. When Immanuel Kant later came to reflect on what sacrifice might mean to an enlightenment philosophy and science founded in the universal moral law, he exhibited extreme squeamishness. In a way then, the same tensions exhibited between Luther and the Roman magisterium recapitulated themselves here, but now in a modern guise which explicitly ranged sacrificial rituals over against the new scientific metaphysics and rational religion of the Aufklärung. To be sure, the contents of revealed historical religion can, according to Kant, play some preparatory and aesthetic role in bringing the believer to a rational faith. In this sense, concedes Kant, I quote, the superstitious illusion contains the means available to many an individual, which enables him to transform the contingent into something reasonable and moral. But according to Kant, such historically contingent materials such as sacrifice are necessarily inferior to the religion of reason and are ultimately destined to be supplanted by it. Modern man, it is presumed, and it is a man, will eventually grow out of ritual. Now, the nachlass that this pre-modern and modern inheritance on sacrifice leaves us with, then, seems to be this. We inherit a deep problem. If we have a new universal project of moral rationality, which must suppress, hide, or sideline sacrifice, and eviscerate it of its specifically ritual and sacramental power, then this may actually create and sustain an opposite in which sacrifice becomes the more irrational and violent. The rationality of the moral law, we might say, is covertly predicated on its reverse. Now, someone who played a notable part in exploring that underside of the unifying, though potentially violent, force of sacrifice was your local Abaddonian anti-hero, William Robertson Smith, who was forced into exile to Cambridge, became professor of Arabic and um, in charge of the university library, as a result of an ecclesiastical heresy trial here in Aberdeen, but himself had a profound effect on Durkheim's later sociological theory of totemism as a result of his views about sacrifice. But following on from him in somewhat the same tradition, perhaps no one in the 20th century more aptly manifests the continuing split between sacrifice and reason, inherited directly, as we have now seen, from early modernity and modernity, than René Girard, 
with his extraordinarily influential theory of sacrifice as mimetic violence. The continuing influence of this early theory of Girard's, especially with liberal Catholics bent on rejecting a neo-Tridentine theology of Eucharistic sacrifice, I get terribly rude letters from liberal Jesuits when I criticize Girard, remains to me astounding and his followers continue to profound the theory with almost missionary force, long after Girard's own recanting of much of its original detail and expression. For Girard somehow caught the cultural conscience of an increasingly secularized but agonized post-Holocaust culture and convinced it of a deeply pessimistic neo-Freudian myth about human nature. This early Girardian theory of sacrifice is admittedly hauntingly suggestive in its insistent evocation of a primary violence deeply encoded in the roots of humanity. I want what you want, goes the theory, because all desire copies from others, my mimetic desire. When this rivalry leads to violent feelings, which it inevitably does, each again mirrors the other in such negative affect, my mimetic doubling, so-called, until a denouement is reached, the so-called mimetic crisis. This showdown of potential mutual violence can only be dealt with by purging it away on a chosen scapegoat, the so-called single victim mechanism. And herein, according to the early Girard, lie the very origins of religion and of culture. Culture itself is formed and stabilized by the violent scapegoat mechanism. Ergo, sacrifice is essentially violent, and violence is foundational not only to human nature, but to the very possibility and stability of society. Gone, in effect, is the story of the fall from a primary innocence. The fall here is the foundational state of the human, a sort of debased, pessimistic Calvinism, strangely married to the Freudian id. Girard has admittedly sought to correct this picture in more than one way in the work of recent decades, in part to strengthen the force of his own Christology. In a fascinating interview with the feminist author Rebecca Adams, which deserves to be better known than it is, I've put it on your handout, he backtracks on his earlier blanket rejection of the epistle to the Hebrews and acknowledges that there must somehow be good desire as well as violent desire in order for there to be some future prospects for our world. Indeed, he now hypothesizes, rather in the spirit of the later work of Freud, actually, that the one, the violent desire, can somehow be turned into the other, i.e. become a good mimetic desire through reflection on Christ. Though quite how, without some kind of undergirding metaphysic of hope, and or an originally good creation, the strong doctrine of the resurrection, such as some of his followers have put into the picture, remains to me somewhat murky. We have here reached a new denouement in the unfolding logic of this lecture. To tell this story of sacrifice in the modern period is to tell a story in which a precious third both behind and beyond the dualisms of rationality and violence, seemingly got lost. Notably lacking is any remaining vision of an intrinsic, organic unity of sacrifice, ritual practice, and reason. Lost is precisely what St. Paul urged in his epistle to the Romans, Romans 12.1, in contrast both to the bloody spectacles of the antique pagan world and to earlier Jewish tradition, that Christians should present their bodies precisely as a living sacrifice in logical worship, fusia logica, submitting to a transformative outcome of something done once for all in Christ, yet still demanding an ongoing process of sanctification in them. So bearing that in mind, now I come much more briefly, to evolution. Perhaps it is not so surprising, then, that in a similar time span in the late 20th century, violence, aggression, and selfishness came, at least in the popularized forms of evolutionary theology, 
so much to the fore in the cultural imagination. Yet for the young student Darwin, well before Origin of Species, very different interests primarily compelled him. He wrote later in his autobiography, for instance, that it was the mandatory reading of William Paley's Natural Theology, much maligned figure, with its exploration of the wonder and order and harmony of the natural world that most entranced him in his student days at Cambridge, when the curriculum, I'm afraid, otherwise bored him, apart from the Euclid, which he enjoyed. Later, when Darwin shared what he called Paley's premises, one could still say that his theory of evolutionary adaptation continued to echo something of Paley's vision of order. It was also Darwin's remarkably original insight in older age about the positive sacrificial working of group efforts to a shared end, this too we call natural selection, he wrote presciently in The Descent of Man, we'll come back to that on Thursday, that was to prove so suggestive to an early generation of social scientists via the work of Auguste Comte and his so-called invention of altruism. This was a newly coined term intended by Comte precisely to describe forms of non-selfish behaviors in a way that would not conjure the bag and baggage of Christian theological tradition. Nonetheless, Comte's work evoked a passing trend in American Protestant liberal theology, now well forgotten, that naively assumed that humanity was set on an optimistic upswing of inexorable moral improvement, as indeed had not Darwin also believed. Two world wars buried that naivete in rubble, one might say. But the later lurch to the opposite pole of cynicism about human selfishness and necessary violence, the intense accentuation of that crucial dimension of competition in Darwin's theory of selection, is something that one is hard put to explain without something of those other trends in cultural reflection that I've already been seeking to expose. Combined, of course, with a concomitant shift in evolutionary theory occasioned by the discovery of the genome and the new fascination with specifically genetic explanations of individual behaviors. By the time we get to Dawkins' brilliant popular espousal of the theory of the selfish gene, still is, still is the most amazingly well done piece of writing, so seductive and so depressing, and now so ev evocative of a generation that produced both boom and bust economically. Recall that the disgraced Jeff Skilling of Enron actually appealed to it in his attempted legal defense, uh, much to D uh, Dawkins' embarrassment. It's not surprising to discover that Girard too has more recently connected his theory of mimesis to the discussion of evolutionary violence. Admittedly, Girard is deeply critical of some aspects of Dawkins' position, especially his theory of cultural means, but there are also profound underlying consonances in Girard with the central drift of Dawkins' thinking, as should not surprise us. There was something then about late 20th century stories of sacrifice and late 20th century stories of evolution, which ironically converged on a shared theme and which seemingly left classical Christian annunciations of productive sacrificial rationality, founded in an original ontology of hope and rendered efficacious by the incarnation, radically sidelined in the cultural imagination. So what we must now ask, and finally, had been happening to the notion of Christian rationality in this same time span in which Girard's influence on the notion of sacrifice had been so notable and culturally emblematic and Dawkins' enunciation of evolutionary selfishness so deafening? Answer, it had been in a notable retreat from concerns for public apologetics. As a mythology of primary violence had advanced in evolutionary thinking, so major forms of Christian rationality had been withdrawing with a variety of increasingly complex and subtle maneuvers from direct theological confrontation with scientific rationality. Although there were, of course, many honorable exceptions to these trends, I think by now most of them have been slurped up to become Gifford lecturers out of desperation, 
by and large, mainstream theology, both Protestant and Catholic, embarrassedly preferred to leave it to the fundamentalists or their more sophisticated ID mutants to hack it out in the public square with atheistical forms of evolutionary theory. Or so I shall now briefly argue before drawing the strands of this rather complex first lecture to a conclusion. I see, said Daniel Dennett, triumphantly rising up from the back of the auditorium at the end of one of the sessions of the 2009 Cambridge Darwin Conference, devoted to Darwin and theology, which I happen to be chairing. You're routed, you theologians. You are all in manifest retreat. His words, I thought, had painful point, coming at the end of a session in which all four of the theological con contributors had espoused what David Ferguson has called one of the only remaining options for contemporary natural theology in a weak form, that is, the compossibility of theological perspectives with standard classic Darwinian theory. I have already mentioned this characteristically liberal maneuver critically earlier, for it tends to appeal to a form of neo-Kantian disjunction whereby fact and value can be neatly distinguished, and religious meaning systems superimposed over a scientific theory like Darwin's as a merely optional interpretive extra, a sort of personal preference. Admittedly, this approach comes in various forms, some a good deal more sophisticated than others. Yet one can't help noticing that it represents a kind of weird liberal inversion within a similar neo-Kantian frame of a certain kind of revelatory positivism in the followers of Barth, which rejects the fallen factual world of natural theology altogether. Both these inverted mirror images make a sharp distinction between facts and interpretations. For Dennett, of course, such a weak liberal optionalism for the already converted Christian was nothing but a sick joke, which he immediately enjoyed parodying on his blog the self-hiding characteristics of a canotic Christology made consonant with Darwinism, he found particularly and deliciously funny. But what then are the major alternatives to such an optionalism? No one could accuse the eminent Calvinist thinker Alvin Plantinga of retreat from the fray with secular metaphysical naturalism. His quite different policy of defeating the defeater, as he puts it, at the level of metaphysical excavation and critique has been increasingly exercising him of late, although his earlier interest in some aspects of the intelligent design movement has rendered him suspect to many of his Christian conversation partners. What must be underscored more significantly in this context, however, is that planting as brilliant earlier maneuvers in his so-called reformed, with a capital R, that is, neo-Calvinist epistemology, had carved out a most clever way of justifying Christian claims to truth, specifically and only for Christians, making their claims to various sorts of religious experience, as he puts it, properly basic, and thus safely hermetically sealed from secular critique. In a way quite different from the liberal compossibility option, therefore, reformed epistemology could also be seen as an intra-Christian rationality which precisely protects itself from any disturbing incursions from the public scientific realm. Evidentialism, with all its potential to send disturbing messages from the scientific to the theological discourse, to critique or subject to new intense gaze aspects of the theological heritage, was the now despised modern philosophical project which had been decisively ruled out by the sophisticated form of intra-Christian Protestant rationality. The third major option then, and the one with which, as will become evident throughout this series, I feel the most initial affinity, was what might be called re-traditionalized Catholic thought, represent most powerfully philosophically by Alistair McIntyre's new rendition of Christian and specifically Thomist rationality as inexorably historical in nature, yet nonetheless philosophically superior thereby 
<clears throat> to the false hopes of the encyclopedists like Gifford, who yearned for timeless completeness in philosophical truth. Yet we have to mention that the great burgeoning of exciting, historically attuned versions of Thomism in this same late 20th century period that I have been describing, many of them in unexpected but fruitful alliance with both Bartian and Wittgensteinian strands of thought, could also produce a notable squeamishness about doing battle with evolutionary theory in its own court. The reason this time was itself theologically, the theological and specifically Thomist. Or Thomist, according to a new reading of him, represented by Fergus Carr, for instance, in which the five ways were not intended as probative arguments for the doubter, but reminders to the already convinced believer of the infinite mystery and difference of the creator. So this recovery of the profound Thomist sense of the absolute ontological difference of God's being from the creation could come, ironically, with another and new means of escape from direct confrontation with secular scientific rationality. It wasn't this time that religious meanings of evolution were mere interpretations on the one hand, like the liberal strategy, nor, secondly, that religious rationality was finally protected from such possibilities by its status as properly basic within the Calvinist ranks of belief. No, this third sophisticated Catholic move was what might be called a no-contest accord. Each sphere of discussion, the evolutionary and the theological, could inhabit their different magisteria at different levels without danger of clash, such that, in the words of the late lamented Ernan McMullen, I quote, there is nothing about the evolutionary process in itself that could lead one to recognize in it the deliberate action of a planner. That's a very weird thing for a Thomist to say. There is nothing about the evolutionary process that could lead one to recognize in it the deliberate action of a planner. This is because, from the no-contest perspective, there is no need to submit oneself to the dangers of a showdown with secular ideology or contentious evolutionary evidences. The certainties of religious faith are again, in parallel with the Calvinist alternative, differently located. We have come a long way here, a long way into fragmented postmodernity, we might say, from the confident, rational apologetics of a Vatican I and its earlier brand of Thomas neo-scholasticism. Let me now conclude <clears throat> with a natural theology now. I have tonight taken the liberty of painting in some incautiously broad brushstrokes the story of a set of recent cultural trends in social science, evolutionary theory, and philosophy of religion, and that for a reason. It is this. I seek to reinvigorate the courage to persevere in the task of natural theology quite newly conceived. For otherwise, theology is indeed consigning itself to the sectarian margins of public debate. When I talk now to thinking Christians concerned about the apparent hegemony of a particular kind of popularized evolutionary theory that has come up to this point, time in the late 20th century and the early 21st century, I notice that these Christians suffer from two sorts of paradoxically related anxiety. One is the fear of genetic reductionism, which they associate, rightly or wrongly, with Richard Dawkins. It seems to threaten their sense of human freedom and hope to cramp the eschatological horizon of grace and glory that Christian faith holds out to him. The second anxiety is one of complete evolutionary randomness, which they associate, again rightly or wrongly, with the late Stephen Jay Gould and his much-quoted remark that the tape of evolution could never be rewound and played again in anything like the same way. The first anxiety leads to a sense of loss of authentic human freedom. The second to a chaos of infinite and unregulated choices. Both seem to constrain the imagination of the human back to what is just given 
in the evolutionary process. It is one of the major purposes of this series of lectures to lay these particular anxieties to rest. They are, in fact, false theoretic bewitchments, and the courage to regain a sense of how natural theology could reinvent itself without any naive acceptance of secular evolutionary theories, regnant metaphysics, but yet by the closest attention to how it too is reinventing itself, theoretically and hermeneutically, is what I am about in these lectures. How odd it is indeed that so celebrated an evolutionary theorist as E.O. Wilson, who long ago abandoned his youthful childhood Baptist belief and became deeply associated for many years with the Dawkensian project, has recently insisted that only the affective power of religious faith can hope to mobilize action to save the planet from ecological disaster. How odd it is, too, that another Harvard biologist with whom he is now collaborating, the Catholic evolutionary theorist Martin Novak, has recently formulated mathematically five rules, five rules, not five ways, for the evolution of cooperation, which he claims put sacrificial cooperation on a par with mutation and selection as a fundamental principle of evolution and as an intrinsic part of the mathematical structures of evolutionary populations. It is to a critical investigation of these claims that I turn my attention in the next lecture, because it was with Wilson and with Novak, as they were undergoing a transformation in their thinking a few years ago, that I was working closely in the three-year research project mentioned by your principal at the start. Here, next time, we shall begin to see whether sacrifice can indeed be regained biologically, ethically, and theologically, and if so, what this means for us humans. I thank you for your attention. Professor Coakley, thank you very much for such a wonderful lecture which I'm sure has given everyone masses to think about and also probably many things that they wish to ask. We've got time, colleagues, for uh, a few questions. And um, could I just ask if you, when you do uh, make a question, if you could just very briefly just give your name um, so that we can uh, know who is uh, asking the question. And could I ask you, as ever in Aberdeen, to a plea for clarity and brevity uh, in, in your questions. So, colleagues, who'd like to start? Thank you very much for this inspiring um, lecture, Professor Coakley, Bernd Vandenberg, Aberdeen. Um, I think this, it is really very encouraging to hear about um, research that um, would allow us to conceive of the evolutionary process as not being driven by the law of the jungle primarily, mm -hmm. but almost by, by kind of a, a third principle um, mm -hmm. besides um, mutation and selection mm -hmm. that might even be thought as to governing the two mm -hmm. uh, uh, other principles. Um, my question is probably a little impatient because you, you may want to elaborate mm -hmm. on, on that um, in the forthcoming lectures anyway, but um, it is about the equation that you seem to make between the, the principle of cooperation and sacrifice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, having been part of a working group in Oxford uh, over many years, an interdisciplinary uh, working group on sacrifice, one of the main difficulties we found with the phenomenon is the difficulty to define it, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it has to be more than purposeful giving a sense of giving away seems to be um, essential to it, and hence a sense of suffering um, that is associated with it. And um, that, of course, would um, put the question in a sort of more difficult light as to whether uh, uh, the principle of evolutionary cooperation could be called sacrifice insofar as um, it is... A, 
categorically different thing to forego a possibility, a possible uh, evolutionary advantage from um, an actual giving up mm -hmm. of something that is yeah. actually there and yeah. possessed. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could um, just give a few hints towards um, what, what um, we we'll, can expect from your further lectures in Excellent. regards to those questions. Well, I'm so glad that you weren't slumbering yourself about these problems because, of course, two points. First, you're absolutely right that I am rhetorically um, uh, trying to engage you by immediately using the word sacrifice here when a great deal more uh, semantic definition is needed. Um, and actually, that's one of the first things I'm going to do next time because, believe it or not, even within the scientific realm, uh, the word cooperation and the word altruism are being used in a bewildering number of different ways, and it's causing evolutionary biologists to disagree when actually they're passing in the night because they're cutting the cake differently, all right? Um, but secondly, I entirely agree with you about the very problem of definition even when we're not talking about evolution, as I think I mentioned in that one rather lengthy sentence which had all those anthropological words in it. Um, sacrifice is a sort of field-encompassing, term-encompassing notion, which precisely seems to have its power because of the paradoxically re related features that adhere to it, both destruction and transformation, <clears throat> both violence and new life, and so on and so forth. And therein it seems to lie a great deal of its uh, inherent power. I'm going to be going on to argue that there are, in a moral perspective, which of course we can't find straightforwardly in the evolutionary spectrum, the pre-human spectrum, um, in the moral uh, arena, um, there are sort of demonic versions of sacrifice and transformative forms. And a lot of the ethical discernment is about how to tell the difference between the two. And even before we get to the human realm, if you put it that way, um, there must be some way of discerning how to define what exactly it is that is being given up when cooperation happens, all right? And actually, that's one of the great problems in the definitions because trying to define exactly what is a cost and what is a benefit is one of the greatest difficulties. So I think you put your finger on two very, very crucial and significant central problems, the general definition of sacrifice when applied to the human realm and the problem of moving from the pre-human to the human. But it's precisely how to negotiate that that's going to be exercising me in the next two or three lectures, because there's an awful lot of nonsense being written at the moment, uh, which attempts to move much too quickly from evolutionary evidences into, as it were, Christian moral lessons in this area. So thank you for that warning. Thank you very much. <clears throat> next. Well, if that's... Just, please. Good. Catherine Wilson, Aberdeen. Um, I'm interested in, in uh, your perspective on Darwin's own view of uh, what he thought of as the higher moralities, because Darwin, as you know, thought that sacrifice and altruism and cooperation were widespread in the animal kingdom as well as in human life. He just thought of it as a not very absolute principle that sometimes selfish interests would win, sometimes altruistic. But he, like Huxley, um, who took this very strong Buddhist mm -hmm. position in evolution and ethics, really thought that um, nature was not going to be enough, that, mm -hmm. that uh, the tendency to um, disregard or even persecute the old and the sick and the weak was something that animals and people did, unless instructed by the higher moralities. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in the way in which you're really uh, going to a much more biological position than Darwin himself mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could say something mm -hmm. about your reasons for doing so. Um, well, I guess what I'm trying to do is to get my hands around in a way that I think Darwin himself knew that he couldn't. He had very interesting intuitions about how altruism featured um, Oh, he actually called it sacrificial um, forms of behavior. But he, I think he himself would have admitted 
and did admit that he couldn't give an exact account of how they fitted into his otherwise quite clear account of the relationship between mutation and selection. So my first task is to see what new light has been thrown on that particular issue um, down to the smallest um, items in the evolutionary spectrum um, and to see whether we can trace any kind of patternings that actually are to be found right through the spectrum up to and including the higher primates. I'm interested in whether we can trace any specific forms of interesting development here, whether there are general rules, whether there are any patterns which Darwin himself couldn't see, but which the mathematical modelings of these behaviours now appear to be able to see. So I'm, you know, I understand Darwin's um, agnosticism about this, but I think it's precisely the area where new developments are extremely interesting. So that's my motivation. That doesn't mean then we can walk from the pre-human into the human without an enormous change of gear um, and trying to indicate exactly what that change of gear is is one of the most difficult philosophical dimensions of this undertaking. Does that partly answer what you were after? Colleagues, Professor Coakley, thank you so much. I'm going to draw the discussion, if I may, to a close now. Um, but in doing so, firstly, to, to thank, you much for, for, thank you very much for an enthralling uh, and engaging uh, lecture, which I think sets the scene uh, for, for the remainder uh, of the series. And I know that uh, in this technological age, electronic diaries will be being changed all evening uh, to enable colleagues to, to be at one of your future lectures. I have to say personally, that your Damascene conversion to mathematics. Um, I'm delighted that you used the discourse rules instead of laws, which I always feel is personally is completely wrong. Um, so uh, I encourage you in, in your further work in this regard. But please, I wonder if we could, um, if you join me in thanking Professor Coakley for such a wonderful lecture, but could I just uh, invite everyone to a wine reception um, or indeed soft drink reception in the James Mackay Hall immediately afterwards. But before we do so, could we thank Professor Coakley for a wonderful first Gifford lecture? Thank you.